All right. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, the sculpting tools in Blender. So um, anybody who's been here for a previous Blender talk that I've given, which is probably no one. Uh, oh, yeah, you? Okay, right. So in contrast to what we were covering in that, which was about manipulating vertices and creating forms by, um, you know, by, uh, I don't know, heads exploded. I have no idea what I'm saying. But um, yeah, instead of, instead of like... Um, using the sort of vertex ma manipulation tools to create shapes, we're actually going to uh, have a sort of more analog approach to um, to to sculpting, more like what you would do with clay uh, in the real world. Um, there are a lot of overlaps and a lot of times where you would want to do both, and like you wouldn't want to necessarily limit yourself to one style or another. But because we're focusing on uh, the sculpting tools in particular here, that's what I'm just mostly going to use today and not uh, not cover too much of anything else. If anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, ask away and interrupt. Um, I'm As part of demonstrating what's going on, I'm going to attempt to make a character from scratch uh, and we'll see how far we get with that. Um, but yeah, to start with, uh, what I'll do is I'll, we've got our default cube here. I'm going to add a subdivision surface modifier uh, to it with uh, two levels and then apply that so that we've got something that's got it's not quite a UV sphere, but it's got a, a, a decent number of faces on it. Uh, just gives us something to work with here. Um, and then down here, where you select your know, edit mode, normally if you're doing that kind of editing, uh, you can go to sculpt mode, which gives you a slightly different interface. In Blender 2.8, I think there's a like a sculpt setting up the top here somewhere for like a sculpt workspace they call it. Um, So it looks it looks like more or less Blender as you know it. Um, if you're familiar with Blender, that is, uh, you'll have like a round cursor here uh, or round brush shape. It looks kind of hard to see on the uh, projector screen here. Uh, you can press F to enter like brush scale mode if you want to have a big brush or you want to have a small brush. Um, but we'll work with something this size. Uh, the brushes that you use are a bunch of different presets. Uh, there's a way to make your own, but I'm not entirely certain. Um, of how to do that, I haven't uh, haven't expanded, experimented with that much yet. But the uh, um, <clears throat> most of these are kind of analogs for what you would do if you were working with a physical medium. Um, uh, but some of them are, are not. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll work through them one by one. Um, so blob here is is about. Hang on, let me. You know, enable a thing called Dyn Topo, which uh, will increase the resolution of the mesh where we're painting. Uh, and that way we don't have to have a super high resolution mesh to create a... Um... Is everybody familiar with what the word mesh means? I worry that we might be using some terminology here. Okay, good, good, good. Um, so yeah, in, instead of having like these being limited to these these squares and triangles that we have here on the shape uh, that we're using at the moment, Dine Topo allows us to just paint onto the... Uh, or sculpt onto the, the thing and it will create extra vertices and extra faces where needed. Um, so the blob thing is about um, you know, extruding surfaces and creating lumpy uh, shapes. You can see that I can can just kind of click and drag to, to paint onto there and it's it's creating very solid uh, lumps about the size of my brush here. Um, we have clay, which is the same kind of thing but a little bit less pronounced. There's clay strips, which is similar again, except um, it's, uh, it's kind of more of a, a flat strip than a, a large mound shaped uh, thing that you're popping on. Um, clay strips is probably what we're going to use the most of. There's a crease tool which allows you to either introduce existing creases or amplify existing ones. Um, and that can be used to help give a, you know extra detail and definition to, uh, to the shapes that you want. Um, there's fill and deepen and that will allow you to you know, if you've used the crease tool, for example, or you've got some lumpy bits that you want to smooth out, you, you can fill in those little crevices. Um, and then if you want to deepen, um, so basically think of it as it, it raises and lowers the contrast of, I don't know how to use deepen properly. Oh, there we go. There it's good. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's about sort of increasing or decreasing the contrast between the, the peaks and the valleys within the, the area that the brush covers. Um, there's flatten, which is pretty intuitive. Or flatten out any peaks or troughs that you've got kicking around in your thing. There's grab where you can just grab a bit and move it. This doesn't uh, create any new. Uh, you know, I mentioned that that Dyn Topo allows it to create new uh, geometry or new new 
higher resolution mesh wherever you're painting. Grab doesn't do that because it's about moving the existing geometry um, around. Uh, and so you can kind of get yourself into weird, ugly situations and it may not be what you're after. Um, let me just uh, flatten that out because that's, that's crazy. And we'll come back and haunt us later. Um, <clears throat> If you want to, if you want to actually kind of extrude a bit out, uh, you can use the snake hook tool, which will create new geometry along the way and allow you to sort of create um, tentacles. Really, is the only thing it's good for. <laughs> no, I use it for um, for a bunch of stuff. Um, they both have their place. Like sometimes you might go, oh, I really like the the geometry that I've got here. I really like the detail that I've got here, but I kind of need to move it around just a touch. Um, sometimes the grab tool is good for that. Um, inflate and deflate, um, basically it just it just kind of takes what's there and expands it or contracts it. Uh, so it's got it's got an option toggle here. You can hold down control and it will um, will do the opposite uh, if you don't want to manually press the button every time. Um, but yeah, inflate and deflate can be good for uh, you know if we've got this existing tentacle and we kind of want to just thicken it up, we can uh, can do that kind of thing really easy. Easier than we would if we were if we were kind of like painting the clay on would be a, a bunch more work. Um, there's layer, which is kind of like the. Oh, hang on. I don't know what we're doing here. Let's try again. <laughs> there's layer, which I've never really used before, and is doing things that I don't expect. So uh, uh, I can't offer any advice on what that's meant to do, but it certainly um, is giving us an adventure there. That's that's a whole bunch of fun. You can hold down shift while you click and drag as well, and that can do a. Um, uh, it's similar to the flatten tool, but it doesn't uh, like sort of regenerate the mesh. If I the the resolution that Dine Topo creates for the mesh is relative to to how close the viewport is to the uh, to the mesh. So at the moment, it's eight pixels is the maximum amount of detail that it will make. That means that if I grab the flatten tool and I zoom right out, and I do some click and drag, you'll see that it's completely reduced the uh, the resolution of the mesh. Um, which can be really handy if you kind of go, oh, it's too too high poly there. I can just kind of zoom out and uh, and bring it down. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm not I'm not really sure what layer is doing here. I guess it seems it seems to be not adjusting the um, the uh, the topology. So maybe it's kind of like clay strips, but it's more pronounced and doesn't doesn't increase the resolution of the mesh. Um, the mask tool allows you to paint regions that you don't want the other tools to affect. So I can now, um, you know, paint around this area. Uh, if you've got some detail that you want to preserve while you're working, uh, that's that's kind of how you do that. Uh, and I think it's shift click. Yeah, shift click and drag will, will get rid of it. Um, there's probably a shortcut key for clearing it, but I'm not sure what that is. Uh, nudge is kind of like grab but it's it's um it's a little bit uh what's the best way to describe it it's less forceful um so it doesn't it doesn't grab things entirely it allows you to to kind of gently nudge things around uh more subtly and with multiple clicks and it does uh change the resolution of the mesh um pinch and magnify are uh, similar to the crease tool uh in that you can you, know, you can use it to, to increase your creases or um, oops, wrong button uh, or to, to sort of blow out your creases. Those are the two kind of options. But I think pinch and, and magnify is a little bit more extreme than um, than than the crease tool is. I tend to, to just stick with the crease tool because I find that uh, a bit a bit more uh, easier to work with. Uh, this scrape, which if you if you run it. Uh, was, a, was a good example of something. Yeah, okay, so here, um, if I run it upward across here, that we've, we, we used to have like this kind of mountain here, and it will it will push the high area down to match the lowest areas that you're, uh, you're going past, so you can uh, effectively carve a trench into an existing peak. <clears throat> sculpt, uh, uh, sculpt draw, it's called, is similar to the, the blob that we had before at the very beginning. Um, at the but it's a little bit, um, I guess, finer, I suppose. Uh, I like to use it for just kind of manual extrusion uh, if I want to want to create a shape uh, that looks like a pig's ear or something. Uh, it's pretty easy to do there. We'll be using that a little bit today. Um, smooth, if we, as an example, we've got some bumpy geometry here. If we smooth on that, it will uh, sort of flatten all that out. 
similar to the woo, similar to the flatten tool here, um, but sort of more aimed at removing noise uh, from um, from your geometry. Um, we did snake hook already. Thumb is kind of again similar to grab, um, but but just sort of slightly different behavior. Um, where you can you can click and drag to move things around. Uh, and twist, which um, uh, what are we gonna do here? Yeah, okay. So we can we just kind of grab and 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 twist. Does what it says on the box and has not really been useful to me so far. Very odd. Uh, all right, so that's um, <clears throat> that's a quick introduction to the different tools that are available. Oh, there you go. I use twist too much. Uh, we're going to go back to object mode. We're going to delete that and we're going to go back to our cube. And cube. <clears throat> And oh, interesting, interesting. <laughs> the order was different as well. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'm I'm not going to touch much on texture, but you can add uh, a texture to the brush so that you can do textured painting as well if you want to like imply fur or or you want to do the equivalent of what you would do with bump mapping elsewhere, you know, if you want to add that kind of detail in, and then you can bake it out to uh, a texture map that you put on a lower res model and, and blah, 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 blah. But uh, it's it's a feature that's kind of helpful if you do want to add that kind of detail in. Uh, we're probably not going to go that far today. Um, so I thought I'd just mention it rather than, than dive into it. The curve thing, let me extend this out. <clears throat> the curve uh, option is, is kind of useful. The default curve is done top of, what do we got? Oh, yeah, let's come back to clay strips. Um, so the default curve is this kind of gradual uh, S shape. It's half of the, uh, if I press F, you can kind of see here that it's, well, you probably can't see there. Um, it's, it's sort of, mm. <laughs> it's sort of dark in the middle and then tapers out to the edge. If we think about that shape, the curve is, represents the level of opacity that the brush has. So at the at the very bottom, it's transparent. At the very top, it's solid. And this curve gives us this this kind of fading out circle that we've got there. Um, if I change to this this square shape here, which is a preset, there's a whole bunch of presets here. You can click and drag if you want to make your own. Um, but yeah, if we use the square thing, then we've got like a completely solid brush to be using there. Uh, and sometimes you know you might want a brush that is is more kind of focused in on a point rather than than like a a, a more spread out uh, circle. So, so those are those are good to be aware of. Um, and then the other thing that's probably worth playing with is the symmetry lock option down here. We've seen that um, it's been painting on both sides of the uh, the mesh as I've gone. We can just click X to turn that off, and now we can work on one side. Or if we want to mirror X and Z, then we can we can mirror two dimensions at once, it's it's not a big deal. Now uh, you can do all three if you if you like that. That's a good question. Let me uh, so mirrors mirrors off here uh, and I'll I'll just you know paint a bit more detail in here uh, and then we will turn X, Y, and Z mirroring back on and then we will We'll paint some more here. So you can see that this elevation doesn't exist in the other axis, so it's not doing anything. But if I paint here, it is still um, affecting this area, though to a lesser amount because it's not within the radius of the brush, if that makes sense. Like the, the bit that I've pulled out there is, is, is bigger than the radius of the brush in three dimensions. Um, so it, it, I guess that's as gracefully as you can expect it to cope. Um, yeah. Uh, and this history, which I've never played with, let's see what that is. You can undo and redo a repeat last, and you can bring up a list of things that you've done. That's cool, but it's just like the normal undo history by the looks of things. So, yeah. Um, right. That's that's kind of a brief, very brief introduction to the tools. Uh, these buttons with the finger poke and a worm. Uh, indicate that they have uh, pressure sensitivity support for those um, those properties, like the radius of the brush, the strength of the brush, how much smoothing there is, um, that sort of stuff. I didn't bring a tablet with me today, uh, but that's definitely a viable option. Uh, 
mouse is fine too if you don't have that equipment um, as hopefully I will be able to demonstrate. Does anybody have any questions on the tools before we move on to to anything else? No? Hopefully that was easy enough to uh, to keep track of. Probably, hopefully it didn't sound like as much of a, a mess as it felt. <laughs> I, I tend to zoom in and zoom out. Um, mostly because by default the um, let's go back into sculpt mode. The Dyn Topo and and Dyn Topo is only one way. Oh, hang on, I'm not going to turn it on right now. Um, but Dyn Topo is only one way of of dealing with this issue of sometimes you want to give more detail than the underlying mesh has. Um, there's another thing called a multi res modifier, which is a better option in many cases. Um, but I feel like for what you know, just for just for focusing on what the tools are and what they do, that Dyn Topo is a better solution. The main difference is that um, when you use Dyn Topo, you kind of don't really have much control over the topology that ends up being made. So, topology refers to the makeup of the mesh, the the way that the vertices are positioned within the faces, uh, and the the way that the faces are ordered. So you can you can have uh, multiple different ways of creating the same shape, if that makes sense. Like we've got we've got this interesting sphere here that I've added, but I could also add a UV sphere, which kind of more or less looks like the same kind of shape, but its its polygons are yeah you can see there those polygons are completely different orientation and different uh, configuration. Um, now if you're just doing if you're just doing a, a static render where you just want a two D image out the other end, um, Dyn Topo is probably fine. If you want to texture that, uh, or if you want to animate that, or if you want to put it in a piece of real-time software like a game or something, you're going to care a lot about the topology because you want to keep it as minimal as possible to use fewer resources. Um, and, and also with texturing, UV mapping becomes a lot less complicated when your mesh is a lot less complicated. Um, so what, uh, what, what the multi-res modifier does is allows you to say... Um, uh, it allows you to dynamically move between different um, mesh densities, so you can you can work at a really high resolution level, and then you can press a couple buttons, and it will drop it down to a low, lower resolution, but still preserve a lot of the detail. Um, the reason I'm not going to cover that much today is because I haven't messed with it much myself. Um, but um, having made 3D assets for games before, I'm, I'm pretty kind of aware of, of the limitations of, of Dyn Topo in that regard. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. So I, I promised everybody that I would make a thing today. Um, and what I thought I might make... Oh, hang on. We can we can take a look at some, some other things. The last thing that I sculpted was this, um, which is a cool tree man based on some... Art <clears throat> it's based on... An existing thing. Uh, I, I work with a, a game development company in Queensland called Defiant Development. They make a game called Hand of Fate. This is one of the enemy types um, that's already in the game, um, but I wanted to use some of their uh, reference art and concept art as a, a base for learning how to sculpt stuff myself. Uh, so, so yeah, I went I went through this guy. He's <clears throat> he's got um, you know moss and other detailing on him that I haven't put in here because it's it makes sense to do those by other means. Um, but for sculpting, it was a lot of good practice because it's got a lot of interesting detail and, and stuff. Uh, and then I was able to kind of do a few renders. We were wrong way <coughs> of um, of this character um, looking interesting. And then um, eventually got it in the game. Where is it? Yoink. No, that's that's another fancy render for fun somewhere. I knew I saved it. Um, oh, there it is. Yeah, uh, so in game it becomes this kind of. You can't see that. Never mind. It looks looks good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, today I'm gonna I'm gonna draw or attempt to draw, sculpt uh, a snail, and it's kind of handy to have a reference sometimes. So here's a reference photo that I've got of a snail uh, climbing over a camera. Um, <clears throat> I did this snail before I came here. Uh, so I have one that I prepared earlier if we lose power or anything. Um, <clears throat> but I found when I was making it that it was really handy to just, I mean, I kind of know what a snail looks like, but when you come, come time to actually make something, 
you realize that there's a whole lot of details that you never really thought about. Uh, and so having having a reference is good. I didn't know which direction the snail shell spirals in. Apparently that's fairly consistent. Uh, there, are, there are some left-handed spiral and some right-handed spiral, um, but, uh, but having a reference lets you uh, <coughs> uh, do a better job of, of keeping track of that. So what I want to do before we start actually sculpting is get a, a mesh that is somewhere within the vicinity of the uh, the form that we want to use uh, just to save myself a little bit of, of effort. So um, <clears throat> I've still got the subsurf modifier on here. I haven't, I haven't applied it yet. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to extrude and add some edge loops in and um, and give us something close to a, uh, a snail shape, I hope. So control uh, R for creating a new edge loop. Uh, and I'm just going to go down here so we've got like a nice flat base on it. Um, and then I'm going to do the same here, and I'm going to go to wireframe mode so I can select the back faces, and we're going to do that, and I'm going to be quick and dirty here and, and hopefully uh, get this over and done with. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them. I'm not really going to go into too much detail about what I'm doing here, uh, since it's not so relevant to the sculpting itself. Uh, what I said about sitting at my own desk and having the keyboard at set height and like pressing the wrong buttons all the time. Uh, there we go. It's looking kind of cool. Um, we probably want to shrink that up though. Yeah, it's, it looks almost like a slug, I guess. Close enough. Um, so we'll go back to object mode and we will add a another cube and we're going to do another thing with this one that's similar to what we've done before. Uh, and we're going to move that across to... Yeah, that's, Oh, we're upside down. One of the downsides of um, of uh, <laughs> one of the downsides of, of Blender upsides downsides hard to say. Um, when you're working in in just a single viewport thing like this, if you don't pay attention to the axis colors, it's very easy to end up upside down or backwards or or whatever else. It's not it's not really a big deal. It just makes me feel a bit embarrassed. Um, yeah, so we want something kind of big. For the shell, and we're gonna scale that just along the x-axis. This looks like we're kind of getting somewhere close to the right size. We're gonna bring it up a little bit because the shell doesn't usually cover the entire thing, and they're offset. And usually, this kind of configuration that looks a bit better. All right, we'll come down just a little. I feel good about that. So we'll apply our, uh, our subdivision modifiers, and now we're ready to get sculpting. So I'm going to start by um, <clears throat> making the body look and feel a bit more snail-like. I'm going to enable Dine Topo here. Eight pixels of resolution. So um, just to just to give uh, or reinforce what that's all about, let's go back to the uh, clay strips here. A slightly smaller brush. So we can paint with the clay strips like this, and we can see that. Um, you know, this is the size of the polygons that it's creating when it's doing that. Um, but if I increase the the detail or decrease the detail size or the, decrease the maximum detail size to um, to like three or something, um, we'll see that it creates a much finer uh, shape without me having to zoom in. Um, so that's, that's that's a thing to kind of keep in mind and keep uh, control of as you work. Uh, it's totally fine to change it as you go. Um, I normally keep it somewhere around 8 to 10 because um, that's like a comfortable uh, thing for me to work out. I don't have to have my brush too small, um, but if I want to make my brush real big um, and I want to work on the thing from, or if, sorry, if I want to make the brush real small and work on something from a distance, then I would, would drop that detail size down. If I want to work with a big brush at a close distance, then I'll probably crank it up a little bit. Um, uh, but yeah, eight's, eight's fine for now. Um, so let's go to Sculpt Draw, and we will let's put some of these. Uh, what am I doing? 
You can press the full stop key on the number pad and it will center the, the view around the last area that you painted, which is quite nice. Um, so yeah, I'm just, just gonna just gonna paint around the edge here some nice lumpy uh, flanging that kind of matches what snails have. How's that look? Yeah, it's looking kind of cool and snail-like. So yeah, you kind of need to to keep track of and, and keep... Um, actually, we won't do that here. We will do that elsewhere. Uh, keep track of how far zoomed in you are. That's that's a thing. Like if I, if I rotate this around and I want to work here, this is heaps closer to the camera or the viewport camera, uh, origin, whatever. Um, so it's, it's not the best example. But if you're, if you're working on something that's a different distance from the viewport, then you're going to be working at a different resolution. Um, so it's a, a good thing to, to kind of keep track of, keep in mind. Um, so let's grab these clay strips and we'll start to smooth out the um, these this kind of interior corner that we've made by um, by flanging out the uh, stuff there. And then we'll just kind of paint, 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 paint. Um, actually, I kind of I kind of want this to taper down a bit more, so I'm, I'm going to hold down Control and, and subtract instead of add. Um, just kind of, yeah, it feels it feels a bit nicer, I think. Um, so we might might extrude that out a bit further with the sculpt draw tool. Question. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick it up on YouTube, or if, if you really want, I can copy and paste it across uh, before we go. Yeah, no problems. Um, and something, I mean, I kind of just like to paint garbage on uh, so that I have, like, something equivalent to noise and that, that it isn't just flat squares or, or triangles or whatever um, to help me, um, <clears throat> what am I saying, to help me sort of better visualize the what the final texture might be I find I find the the uniform grid of, of squares to be a bit uh, I don't I don't know just kind of doesn't put my brain in the right space um, so I want to kind of bring this up a bit more so make it feel like the heads a bit higher than we've we've done here um, and snails the bottom half of the face comes out a lot further than the uh, the top, so we'll just kind of paint in something that feels good here, and the, the mouth is actually in this area here as well, so we'll be able to to put some of that in, which will be kind of fun. Yeah, they kind of kind of almost look like they have a snout going on. Good friends, those snails. Eat all your lettuce. It's good times. Um, so it's feeling pretty good. It's obviously missing something, and this is where the snake hook tool that we talked about earlier is going to come into play. Um, it's difficult to get a feel for where the snake hook tool is going to go um, because you you can only drag it um, uh, along an axis that's perpendicular to what the current view is. So you kind of go, you, you can't pull it towards yourself or away from yourself, if that makes sense. So. So you kind of have to rotate off to the side, and then, uh, and then, then you can stretch it out. Um, but I want to come back and look at my reference because um, I'm not, not feeling super like I've captured that too well. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take another pass. I might, might flatten this out a little bit more. I don't like that so much right now. Just kind of build those strips back up. Bring this bit back out. Um, yeah, all right. Let's 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 have another go at eyes. And I think these kind of things, you know, you you you'll have a few goes at them before you kind of get something that you're happy with. Um, and a lot of how you you might approach this is probably going to be influenced by what end use you're going to have for it. If you're gonna, you know, you might you might want to sculpt something already in an intricate pose. Uh, or you might want to sculpt it in a pose that's easier to put a skeleton on and then move it around um, via an armature. Um, 
you know, depending upon which approach you want, you will, you know, you won't want to use symmetry if you're already posed or, you know, that kind of stuff. It'll, it'll change the way that you, you approach doing things. Um, but sort of generally speaking, uh, I find making use of the symmetry saves me a whole bunch of work. So I'm pretty cool with, uh, with doing that. Um, so yeah, these are, these are heaps thicker at the base. So, you know, I'm going to add a bunch more, uh, material here. Yeah, as far as the final video goes, I don't I don't know whether I'll upload the entire talk of me waffling garbage on for however long it takes me to get somewhere that we're happy with. Uh, I might might even just you know, speed it up and make it like a five minute time lapse or something. But um, yeah, whatever whatever ends up working best with whatever material I, I have at the end, I'll go with. But totally happy to uh, to give anybody who wants it a copy of the full recording. Um, yeah, so we've, we've sort of smoothed this out a bit, and I think um, I think they kind of they bulge out a bit at the end, right? Like we've got this whole fancy fancy bump going on, and we can paint this on with um, with the sculpt tool like this, or the the clay strips tool like this, or we could use the inflate tool, um, which gives us you know it's more focused on on just expanding what's there rather than um, just do that. One of the advantages of, of pressing the full stop key and having the camera centered around the area that you're working is it means that as you rotate around it, it's always going to be equidistant from from the viewport, so you're always going to be uh, <coughs> always going to be painting more or less at the same uh, resolution. Uh, so yeah, let's let's grab the clay strips again and just kind of use a crease tool. Even where's the crease tool on? There it is. Just kind of gently, gently. Increase that out. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good start. I think it needs more though. So let's uh, let's work like this. Yeah, I'm not sure how you go about doing. I'm sure there's a way to do it, um, but I'm not certain about how you would go about doing localized symmetry so that you could maintain symmetry just working on this little bit if you wanted. Um, there are a bunch of options in the symmetry lock setting where you can, um, number of times, oh wow, okay, so you can like, uh, you can have radial symmetry where you could like, instead of having, uh, mirrored along the x-axis like that, you could mirror it, um, into, into like three times, or six or eight or however many, uh, so those options are not for offsetting the, um, <laughs> not for offsetting where the, uh, the point of symmetry is though. So I, I guess you would have to move your mesh around, maybe. Maybe there's a nice way to do it. I don't know. Yeah, you could do that. Yep. Yeah. Um, you could. It gets a bit tricky if you have modifiers attached to. Yeah, let's let's not let's not kill that model. Uh, it gets a bit tricky if you have modifiers attached. It, it complains and moans. And actually, I'll I'll give you a look at, at that. So we can go back into object mode. And I can add a modifier, um, and then if I go into sculpt mode, it'll say, uh, "Oh, sorry, if I go to enable dyne topo, it'll say, no, you've got modifiers that, that work on the mesh that you're currently going to be sculpting on, and that's going to make things all super hard to work with. But there's nothing stopping you from having multiple separate meshes in the way that I've got a separate mesh for the snail shell here. Uh, in fact, people who do uh, character models typically have a, a separate sphere for eyeballs so that they can be rotated independently and, and stuff. So it's definitely a, an easy way to work. And if you want to um, put the original of that mesh on a different layer and have it um, uh, centered at the origin point of the um, grid that you totally can't see on the projector screen there, uh, you can do that and then you can parent that or you can make a clone of that that's parented to an empty object that you can then put in this scene and move around and position it arbitrarily and that way you've got the ability to to kind of work with it at the origin but still have it presented uh wherever you on your own kind of arbitrary position um elsewhere uh what have i got selected now oh we're back in sculpt mode okay good no yes let's turn that top back on oh no i still have this aha uh, -huh. uh yeah all right where was I? Uh, still, still kind of, kind of make it feel like it's tapered. Um, yeah, still, still making this big. So, 
Maybe we should just kind of zoom out and yeah, it's looking better. Because they are quite large, right? Like they're um, they're much larger than the. Uh, well, maybe they're not. Maybe I'm making that up. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's got big eyes. Look at that. What a friend. He's quite um, he's quite fat in the face here. I might uh, might trim that up. One thing that um, when you're sculpting like. <clears throat> it's it's good to focus on form first and detail second because um, if I had a whole lot of, of like tiny intricate details that I uh, was putting in here and then I suddenly go oh no actually I've, I've decided that I want to change the shape of stuff if I then zoom out and um, start modifying the shape then I've lost all that detail um, there, are, there are kind of ways to preserve it but you're always, to some extent, going to be stepping on your own feet and uh, and making extra work for yourself. So, um, yeah, wherever wherever possible, always try to uh, to get excuse me uh, to get the the just the general shape that you want to have down before you uh, before you start you know digging in and putting a lot of detail in. Um, so, for example, with this mesh, you might want to put a, a um, uh, like a texture on it that looks like a snail skin. Um, can we, yeah, it's it's kind of this kind of blotchy sort of thing going on. Um, you could put all that on, but it, I, it would be best to wait until you've uh, till you kind of finished your model um, to do that. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of feeling okay about that. Um, this still needs to come out a bit further, I think. Though. Or a little dude. Um, right, so and more eyes. I was gonna have a joke where I said that I was gonna do like a really simple animal, um, and I was gonna pick a snail because I only have one foot, um, and then I wouldn't have to do lots of feet. But uh, but they have lots of eyeballs, so that kind of makes up for that. Um, but pretend I made that joke and it was real funny. How's that looking? Whoa, you surprised? Yeah, like I said, can take a couple tries to. Uh, to work out where the snake hook is going to go and, and where you want it to go and wow, that's... <laughs> that's not what I wanted. Alright. Uh, maybe we want it to kind of... That feels better, I guess. Um, so sort of similar, similar process again. Gonna blow up those eyes. That's good. It's too big. Um, and we might even um, maybe just kind of shrink down this one because it's like want these to be smaller, right? Uh, da, da, da. And yeah, like like I said before, like you don't, you don't need a fancy pen or tablet if you if you don't want. I'm I'm getting by okay here with the mouse, and it's not even my normal mouse. Um, the I guess because because it's it's more kind of intrinsically organic you're you're I don't know it, it seems it seems a lot easier to to get um, words out of your mouth no it, feel, it feels a lot easier to, to get kind of the organic shapes than um, which I think is why why or at least why I use a tablet you know because I feel like I, I need to um, do a better job of, of drawing uh, organic stuff that's harder to do with a mouse, um, particular line shapes that are difficult to to work with. Um, but yeah, no, I think we're, I think we're doing okay here. Uh, I'm gonna make that make that tiny eye a little bit bigger. Uh, I'm gonna use the crease tool to. Hmm. They're not. They've got pupils. Look at this. All the bottom ones are just tentacles. Ah, cool. But they have pupils too. Tiny hands. They're not crabs. I was going to draw a crab originally. That was that was my plan. But a snail, less feet.
<clears throat> um, yeah, okay, so not 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 great in the uh, the bottom eye department there, um, but uh, it'll do for now. There you go. That's something approximating a snail's mouth. What a friend. Uh, so yeah, now onto, onto the onto the shell, which we've got as a separate object here. Uh, we need to go back into object mode to select it. I think. Can you? Oh no, you can just right click on it and it'll select or left click if you're using a newer version of Blender. Um, yeah, so shapes. Remember to enable don't topo. There we go. Look at that. Um, <clears throat> So I have, have a little bit of an idea here, and I've just remembered that I forgot to disable uh, symmetry, so we'll turn that off, because we definitely don't want any symmetry here. Um, so they kind of bulge out as they uh, they come past the snail's body here. Do, 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 do. Lots of fun, and then we'll, we'll actually kind of pull it up on the inside, like that. Now we can paint a bit more. So you could use the uh, um, sculpt draw thing if you would rather, um, but I find it, the clay strips is nice in that it <clears throat> it's not applying too much material. If you change your mind about what's going on, then it's a bit easier to uh, to to do that. You know, to to go back to whatever you were messing with before. So again, focusing on shape before detail. Uh, I want to kind of get the the general shape that I'm after before I start trying to work out how to put a spiral on there and how to make that look good. Um, snail shells are cool because they're not they don't have bilateral symmetry like most things in the animal kingdom most most things on the planet really have have bilateral symmetry um, so always interesting to find an animal that doesn't Although it does have bilateral symmetry in the rest of its body and face. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's cool. And then I kind of want to just build this bit up a little bit. Yeah, that's looking good. And build that bit up a bit. I can come around here. It's starting to feel snail shell like, hopefully. Uh, yeah, alright, so we can, we can then use the crease tool to push in a bit of definition of, of what's going on here. So. Is our, our curve there coming up around here as we go along coming on down here and then we're back into the uh, the main the main snail the, the primary curl I don't know what are they, what are they called what are the curls called in the shell sorry a whirl. Okay, yeah, primary whirl. We'll use that terminology for a little while. We'll give it a whirl. We reward knowledge here. You get to eat some leftover food. Uh, yeah, so remembering that um, the detail level increases as we zoom in, we can can zoom right in to uh, to get this this final part of the spiral looking good. Look at that, that's cool. Um, and then yeah, just use a crease tool again to kind of put it in. Maybe where does this go? Okay, I see. So crease tool all the way in into here, and then ah. Just kind of making sure that the crease tool doesn't pull the bits that are meant to be extruded the most out because it's not it's not spiraling inward it's spiraling outward uh, and it would be very easy to accidentally push it all in like I have there so pull that back out this comes back to what I was saying before about um, when you're changing the form you're usually going to be stomping on on detail um, but that's fine I find generally with with creative projects, with artistic projects, um, usually there's a whole bunch of um, a bunch of learning about what it is that you're making that you do 
as you go. Um, and so there's nothing necessarily wrong with uh, changing things, growing things, expanding ideas as you uh, as you refine them because you you know as you work you gain a better understanding of what the project is and what the project needs. So uh, yeah, in in that case, um, you know, you'll always strive to to avoid um, putting the the detail on before you put the shape on. But sometimes you need to put the detail on to know what shape you need. Uh, and, uh, and there's nothing to feel ashamed about with that. But yeah, in terms of a, a quick and dirty uh, snail, I'm, I'm coming pretty close to feeling like that's... This is, this is sort of the thing that I had planned to do. If anybody has any other questions or things they would like to know that are adjacent to sculpting or just blender related feel free to ask as i put what i hope are the finishing touches on the does the scale matter um yes and no again it sort of depends upon the the um what your use case is like what are you what are you going to do with it uh when it's done um the uh this tree man that i had before uh that you can't make out on the projector there can i can i make that bigger and zoom in like maybe then it becomes almost clear um they look real small they're on a table in the game that's kind of far away from you uh but the actual mesh scale uh was was like that big to fit in the screen like it, it was enormously large um, and doing that meant that I had to change the near and far clipping distance of the viewport in order to be able to work. So the scale kind of matters from that perspective. Um, if you're going to be doing any kind of like physics simulations, because Blender has some like real time simulation stuff, uh, the scale will play a role in, in determining uh, how all that stuff works and, and what kind of fiddling you'll need to do to make it behave correctly. Um, and yeah, if you're if you're exporting it somewhere, then then scale will matter. But I think I think sort of generally speaking, not so much. If that answers the question. Oh yeah, everyone, <laughs> everyone definitely need to use the same same scale. That's, that's definitely <coughs> yeah, definitely a thing. Yeah. Uh, no, it's kind of equivalent because you're all all you're really working with is um, dots in three D space, and when you zoom in, it's kind of the same as seeing a big thing up close, more or less. Yeah, kind of, kind of. Yeah. That's why it's best to work on your own. <laughs> then you never have anybody complaining about whether you use metric or imperial units. Uh, this is too low. Let's pull that back up. Um, but yeah, so this is this is about as far as I intended to take it. I wasn't going to get uh, too fancy. Um, what are you looking time-wise? Been about an hour. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I guess I could. I guess I could like. Um, go through the process of, of rigging this up a little and uh, and talk about that because I don't think it's too high detail to uh, to worry about that um, yeah the, the back half of the snail no idea don't have any photos of the back half of the snail <laughs> always always focus on the the whirls um, but yeah, I think I think that's an okay snail. We we win at snails. Well done, everyone. Um, yeah, that's even better than the one I did before. Let me uh, where did that go? Uh, snail. There we go. Uh oh. Hmm. Let's get Taslog snail dot blend. Now let's see if we can open the uh, the other one that I did. 
There it is. Is the other one? Mm. Should kind of like the proportions on this one better, but I like shell on the other one better. Um, something that I didn't touch on that some people care about more than others is um, you can press N to bring up the uh, properties shelf here. This one's the tool shelf, that one's a property shelf. Um, and then down here under shading, we can turn on a thing called matte cap, which um, gives you kind of more neutral lighting that can make it easier to see your detail. Um, you know, things like uh, ZBrush and, and other sculpting oriented tools will, will kind of typically focus on that kind of thing. Um, Blender, Blender's main use case is, is modeling and lighting for rendering. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a different use case from, from actually sculpting because you often want to care about and see detail that you won't necessarily want to be visible, uh, in your lighting, in your, like in your rendering lighting setup, um, or, or you want different things to be pronounced. Um, but yeah, let's, let's, um, let's, let's make an armature because that's fun. So we'll call, we'll call the sculpting section of this more or less done uh, and, and I'll, I'll give a, a bit of a look at how to um, put, the, put a skeleton behind this and, and shape it around. Um, so we could, we could um, let's select this guy, we could just grab a big old punch, uh, could just grab a big old bunch of the, uh, the mesh here. Hey, I looked at what's going on. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we could just grab a big bunch of the mesh here and then move it around. Um, but A, that is awkward. And uh, we can use the connected proportional editing stuff, not hide, grab, uh, to like move things that are adjacent to what we're moving um, so that we're not you know, completely smashing the mesh. But it's kind of it's kind of awkward and it doesn't take into account the... Um, or doesn't easily take into account the anatomy of the creature. And if, you, if you're moving a whole bunch of things a whole bunch of times, it makes sense to abstract that into some controls that you can manipulate that will do all the vertex manipulation for you. And we call those kind of control, or we, we use an armature to, um, to express or define what is, uh, <clears throat> what is, what is carried by uh, individual things. I'm kind of talking out my backside while I, uh, while I think about the best way to handle this. So we add a new armature. Um, here it is. It's um, it's a bone thing. It's kind of cool. Uh, and we want to turn on x-ray here so that we can always see it through the mesh no matter where it is. Um, and because my cursor wasn't in the middle, it's not going to be in the middle. Um, so we can actually just manually put that in the middle. Good times. All right. Um, so what I want to do is I want to, what's the best way to do this? We're going to go into edit mode by pressing tab. Um, yeah, I think, I think I want to like have this all the way up here and that's going to be our, uh, our root node that we grab everything by. Um, and then we're going to stick the, uh, the end of that somewhere in, in what would be the middle of the body. Uh, and then we're going to extrude with E uh, up along the, uh, hang on, let's not do that. Let's go into orthographic mode. Yeah, okay. Oh, and we're upside down. I forgot about that. It's good times. Um, <laughs> uh, orthographic mode means that we're not, we don't have any perspective. And because the cam I'm, I've locked the camera to a particular view, um, when I extrude this, I'm guaranteed that it's going to be moving and it's not going to be moving along any of the sideways axes uh, or any of the... Yeah, I, I'm limiting myself to two axes here so that I can more easily and more readily control um, what I'm doing. Uh, so yeah, we're going to extrude this out in, in both directions. Good times. And then we're going to get a top view, which is a bottom view, of course. We can make it a top view. There, there we go. Um, and we can... Just trying to think. Yeah, no, that's fine. All right, we're going to extrude across the side here, and then we're going to grab a front view, and this one's going to come up. 
And this one's going to come up even more. We not that. Just grab that. Yeah, there we go. All right, so they're going to go up to to the base of where the eyes sort of start in the, uh, in the volume of the body. Yeah, yeah that's cool. All right, uh, and now because the eyes aren't really aligned to any axis, we just kind of got to just got to hey, extrude. Keep pressing R by default, by accident. Um, just gonna kind of eyeball that. You'll have to adjust it. That's cool. And these gives us like each each bone becomes a point of articulation. Um, so we can we can bend the uh, the eye around in interesting ways. I'm probably not going to cover things like inverse kinematics, which allow you to set constraint uh, set um, uh, allow allow some bones to influence how other bones behave. We're just just going to go with um, with just linear um, rotational control. You can also scale stuff, I guess, but. It's probably best to only do if you're doing cartoons. At least it doesn't look like cartoons now to me. All right, um, that's cool. And then we want to. Uh, <clears throat> one of the one of the things that you you kind of have to remember to do with your armature and the individual bone is to label and name all of your bones. Um, otherwise, uh, you will get lost and confused, particularly when you're about to do the thing that I want to do. Uh, let's go forward one, forward two, forward three, three. Uh, this is back one, back two. I don't have to worry so much about the shell because I think I'll just tie the shell entirely to this point here so that it, it moves with the rest of the snail. If I was doing a fancy one, I'd probably give it another bone above that extruded off that that I could give it its own articulation to, but I don't, I don't think we need to care too much about that. So where's that? Is that back three? Oh, spell that properly. All right. Um, yeah. So this becomes, uh, it's a tentacle, right? Uh, so this is tent one dot L. Sorry. A oh, feeler. Tent two dot L. So I'm I'm finishing each bone name with with dot L. Uh, tent three dot L, and there's an automatic thing that will mirror this left and right for me in a really nice way. Tent four dot L if they end with dot L or dot R. Um, and that should be right because it is the character's right. Um, and you're always going to bite yourself or kick yourself in the face if you uh, forget whether, um, what is this? this, is I1. Uh, I'll, I'll go with R because I'd rather be correct. To R. Hmm? Sorry? I'm not doing any physics stuff, so up and down don't have any meaning. Three dot. Oh, maybe, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but it it doesn't care either. It just mirrors it along a particular axis and and um, pays attention to whether it ends with L or R. I four dot. This is a really exciting part. It's a bit where I hit eject instead of uh, backspace. It's a very common, common pro move. Um, <clears throat> and now I need to, no, I need to just select the ones that I want. Okay, and not this one. No. 
Unselect this. I don't want this. I want this. Let me select this. Um, I feel like I feel like I want to do this as two operations because I don't want to duplicate this bone, and it seems to be very focused on selecting that. Uh, so. It's not mirror, it's uh I've I've only done this a few times and it's been a long time since I did this, so I uh I don't exactly recall maybe it's a modifier. Mm, no. I feel kinda dumb for not remembering, but you know what, it's not really that much effort to um to just extrude it out again. There's no problem at all. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, all I have to do is just kind of vaguely keep them close to being. I mean, they don't, they don't even need to be symmetrical. It's fine. Like, it's only my own uh, analness that uh, that demands that it should be. Control M. Oh yeah, no, that's right, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, let's go back to this. Go back to our good upside down front view. Uh, so we can go Control D, which duplicates uh, the selection and maintains its parenting, most importantly. Uh, and then Control M, was it? No. Uh. Uh. So duplicated control M and then the axis is X but for some reason it's done it around the median ah okay yeah 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 uh, so let's uh, snap the cursor to the center and then do our control M X no no <laughs> there it is 3D cursor there it is uh, control M X A and if we double check these it has not not remembered the naming, has not done the naming thing. I must have written it wrong. Maybe it has to be a capital L, uh, capital R or capital L. I don't know. Don't know, but uh, we'll just rename them and pretend that that never happened. Um, but yeah, being able to mirror the armature rather than have to go out and remake it a million times is kind of handy if you've got a super complex mesh. This is not. It's not crazy complex. Uh, control D, Control M, X. No. What happened there? <laughs> uh, I didn't press Control D, I guess. Control D. Duplicate. Hello. Shift D. That's what I was doing wrong. Uh, and then this is left. I think there's a way that you can get all of the bones visible in the uh, the outliner here, which is this big list of um, everything that's in the thing. Um, but for some reason, it doesn't show everything for me, and that kind of is weird. Or it doesn't doesn't let me rename them from here. Oh no, it does. Yeah, sweet. Uh, no, I'm I'm very confused. Where is this? This is 10-3 left. That one's the right one. This one's the left one. Have I just gone and, and made right, left, right? Okay, I have not paid attention. So this should be right. I've been renaming the wrong ones. There we go. Hey. Okay, uh, the next step is to, uh, now we want to select the mesh in object mode, we want to add a new modifier, and we want to add an armature modifier, and the object that we're using as the armature is, there's only one, so it's just called armature, which is great, um, and then we want to do... Uh, there's like an auto weight thing. Do I 
fuck up the shortcut for automatic weights because I can't remember it. Um, yeah, because it, it hasn't... Ooh. Yeah, so how we'll how we'll move the armature around is that we'll select a bone and we'll we'll rotate it and these are not parented properly, that's good to know. Is there anything else not parented properly? No. Alright, let's sort that out. Control B? P. Oh for parent, right, yeah, okay. Um so this this bone has lost its parent. Let's sort that out before we do anything else. Um Bones, this is 3R, this is 2R, Tent 3R, can we, yeah I might have, might have lost this when I renamed everything I guess, and this one will be Tent 2L. Uh, let's go back to pose mode, oh no, that one got lost as well, back to edit mode. Normally you don't have to worry about this. <laughs> Tent two dot R. Back to pose mode. There we go. Okay, so everything everything seems to be. We grab this guy. Yeah, it's all all parented properly now. Uh, so we select the mesh first. Did you say? Yes. Mesh first. Mm, not that mesh. A. There we go. Mesh and then armature and then control P, which is the uh, like a parenting thing, um, and I can go parent with automatic weights, which in most cases will give you a, a kind of decent um, decent thing. In this case, it's not, uh, and we'll we'll go we'll cover why in just a minute. Um, but yeah, we'll see how see how it fares to begin with. Okay, sweet. So now with the Yeah. Actually, it's it's better than I thought it would be. Hang on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just want to sort of have a look at what kind of control we got here. Yeah, it's all looking all looking about what I would expect. So no, it's that's better than I thought it would be. So like uh, like Henry was saying, um, <clears throat> it has, and the the best way to visualize this, I'm actually going to go into weight paint mode. With this last piece of the, um, oh yeah, that's visible, good. <laughs> With this last piece of the, the armature selected or skeleton selected, um, we can see that the, the surrounding region is red. That means that the most amount of weight from, uh, we think of it's kind of figurative weight. Um, <clears throat> um, the, the bone has the most amount of influence. That bone has the most amount of influence over those pieces of the mesh. And then all the way through to blue, where that bone has no influence over that piece of the mesh, um, and uh, and often often when you do kind of automatic uh, weight paint, you'll need to um, you'll need to go back in and you'll need to adjust things and tweak things. But I'm I'm feeling like this is this is probably fine, uh, certainly certainly good enough. And then we will also um, select this mesh and parent that. With um, yeah, I did. I think I want to parent this with empty groups, and then I'm just going to go into texture paint mode and select this. Select the bone first. Um, <laughs> and I want to select. How do we do this? There's a nice there's a nice place where I can press an apply button and just add everything to one specific bone. Um, let's get back to object mode. We've got that selected. Maybe we need to have them both selected. Texture paint. No. There's there is a really nice way, and I've completely forgotten what it is. Add simple UVs. Maybe that's what it wants. Okay. And then. No. All right. Maybe maybe we'll just do the automatic thing and then fix it up manually. Object mode. Undo. 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 Undo history. One thing I really don't like about um, uh, make a parent 
Yeah. Uh, one thing I don't like about Blender's um, undo system is that like you've you've got no indicator of whether you're at the end or if the undo was unsuccessful or what exactly has changed. It'd be sweet if it gave you a status message saying what it undid. Um, well, I can I can open up that menu, but when I'm just pressing Control Z, I, I've got no idea what's happening, uh, which is kind of slightly slightly frustrating. Um, so let's then go into weight paint mode because this has done the automatic weight paints. Uh, we have this root uh, bone selected, which is what I want everything to be attached to. Uh, so I can just I just paint paint it all all red, everything red, done. <laughs> um, yeah. That's good enough. Uh, right, so now back to object mode. This guy's in post mode already, so we can, we can rotate like that, or we can rotate this, and it doesn't kind of pull the shell around with it. This does. Good times. Um, in that case, we need texture paint, and then we can select all this. And Aha! There it is. So all of that, um, we're going to assign it entirely to the root. And now it should do what I want. No, why not? Uh, can we select most of these? Actually, we just remove these. We don't need any of these. Ooh. So it's created vertex groups for every single bone, but we really only want the shell to be attached to the root. Um, so now, now it should do what we want. There we go, that's better. Sweet. Um, it looks like poo if you take it all the way down because I didn't sculpt anything at the bottom, but that's fine. Um, so yeah, now now we got now we got a bit of control here over what the snail looks like. If we wanna if we wanna move the shell, it's attached to this root bone which controls everything, so I'd have to have to move everything. Like I said, I'd have a separate bone there for the sh shell if I uh, if I want to do anything fancy, but I don't, so we're all good. Um, so yeah, we can just, uh, just sort of give ourselves a cool. Look and pose for our snail. Make him, make him be going in a circle. It's always fun to keep track of um, rotation along the axis that you're not paying attention to, <laughs> with with this kind of uh, posing. Yes, yeah, a bunch of fun, good times. Yeah, and because because I've not I, before I uh, rigged things up like it would have made sense to um, uh, straighten the eye, and now it's ended up with uh, bumps in it because it was not straight originally. But that's that's fine. It's no big deal for what we're uh, what we're playing with here. It's totally fine. I don't know what it's looking at. It's looking at something. Uh, and then we can just um, get back to object mode, hide the armature, and now our snail is has a pose. You know, uh, we could have sculpted it in this pose or, uh, originally, but because we didn't, we were able to make use of the symmetry tool and save ourselves half the work. Um, yeah, and that's that's kind of what I did when I had the. Um, the tree guy that was sitting on the uh, on the stump there was I I rigged him up as a in something close to a T pose and then then sat him down and and uh, and um, made him look more interesting. Yeah, okay. There's a snail doing stuff. So that is uh, that's about all I was going to cover today. Anybody got any final questions? Um, if I was going to do more sculpting, uh, let's let's go th through the process then. Um, so we've got we've got this selected. Uh, we have an armature modifier. If I then go into sculpt mode and go to add, uh, so I can I can change what's already there. the the thing The thing that that becomes a problem is that when you if you've got something like Dyne Topo or Multi Res enabled, then you're changing the 
amount of vertices that there are, changing the amount of faces, and it doesn't really know how to apply that to the mm -hmm. skeleton because there's no information on how that's meant to be applied. If I go to apply Dine Topo, it says, hey, you know, you've, you've got some other um, vertex data that, that explains, you know, how it connects to the skeleton that it can't handle, and it will refuse to do so. But without adding Dine Topo, I can, I can just, you know, change the shape if I want. Um, and that can be that can be a cool finishing touch if you, you kind of um, decide that oh you go okay so it's it's kind of turning here snails don't look like this but um, we can pretend that it, it needs a crease and we can put a crease in um, uh, where it turns and that's you know that's something so you can do some level of sculpting but if you want to do anything that dynamically modifies the mesh then you you're probably going to have to uh, rework all that uh, remove. Right. Yeah. Let me save that again. Any other questions? Mm. Snails don't even have any bones. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Can you can you adjust the scale of uh, a bone? Yeah, 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 you can. Uh, R ah, S. No, come on. Let me just. There you go. Uh, this is this is what happens when your snail gets elephantitis. Um, yeah, yeah. So you can you can totally do that if you, if you want to do any kind of like, you know, squash and stretch. You can do that. Um, uh, you can even constrain your um, scaling to particular axes. Um, to to assist with that, put your face. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I want to. And you can scale along the local axis as well, which is helpful. So you can go. Oh, I want to scale this along the uh, uh, y axis. A local y axis is always going to be pointing forward along the bone, um, as opposed to scaling it along just the global y axis, which is not going to be aligned to that. So yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that that would be a bit more tricky here. Like if I wanted to grab all of these, um, and then scale them, but not along the local Y. Uh, no, no. Hang on. We do want to scale them along the on the Y only. Yeah. So we can Y local Y only. Oh, it's local to that. We can't do individual local Ys. Yeah. It is. It, it can get tricky. Um, you could do it, but I think you'd want to optimize your mesh for that, um, so that it, you don't end up with too much bunching as you pull it together, which would be like the biggest thing, I think, if you kind of, if you wanted to kind of, all right, and it's cumulative as well. So like, um, each bone inherits the rotation or the scale, uh, of, uh, of its parent, which is why these ones look completely bonkers. Let's put that back. There you go. You're okay. Um, but you can, you can have a, um, you can have a bone that's like offset from, um, other things. Like it's, it's still parented to, but not directly connected to, and then you can move it independently without having to move other things. Um, and yeah, you, you, I guess you would do that kind of stuff, uh, for that. I don't know. I mean, in this case, like I've got a bunch of superfluous bones in here. I could have used that approach with these four here and just like started at the base of the eyes because there's not really much that needs to be attached specifically to this bone. Um, but I find it easier just to make bones, keep it all connected because that's what I, that's what I'm used to. <laughs> yeah, if you if you have a, a complex model, often you'll you'll create. Um, uh, I, I don't know the terminology because I don't do this kind of stuff very much. Um, but you can create uh, like like sort of like proxy objects that become just your controls. So you can go this control, its position along the x-axis determines the amount of uh, curl along the tail here, for example. So you can slide it left and right to make the tail curl left and right. Um, or you can have this one is the target that the eyes will always look at, so that you can move it around and, and the eyes will nicely follow that um those kinds of things if you if you're doing a lot of animation you're doing a lot of posing then definitely invest in those because they you know they save you a bunch of time 
Um, but if you don't know how to do them, then it's probably not best to include it in your lug talk. <laughs> it's an advanced thing. Why a rigger is a separate role, yeah. 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 I remember him wanted a little man. Do you still want a little man? I can find a little man somewhere. Are you good with this now? Okay. Yeah. I should have made him curve the other way because the back side of the shell is boring. And, um, you can't see the interesting curve. Oh, well. Next time. Yeah, so I, uh, I will probably wrap it up there. Thank you for listening. Hope it was interesting. We can turn the lights on now and stop sitting in the dark. Uh, and I will save, save this. Not scale, save. <laughs> uh, I will thank our reference snail. Thank you, reference snail. Uh, and then I'll close this stuff down.